Welcome to Bowl at City U. Many people see the law as a set of rules. This is correct, but it's a limited understanding of what law is. The more interesting question is to understand what the factors are that determine how the rules came about. Only then can you have a more holistic idea of what law truly is. This is a question that should be of interest to all lawyers and to engage citizens who think that certain aspects of the law are outdated and should be changed. If you think that an existing law seems unfair or even absurd, it will be useful to explore the origins of such a law to see whether it should still remain as law today or instead be revoked or at least changed. Let me give you an example. For a very long time, it was the law in many countries that when a woman got married, she lost her personal identity, which became one with her husband's. As such, whatever property she had became her husband's upon marriage, and she could not enter into contracts in her own name. Her husband would have to do it for her. And partly for this reason, there was no offence of marital rape because husband and wife are considered one person. Obviously, in the 20th century, such ideas began to look inappropriate, particularly as more women started to work and were allowed to vote. In Singapore, the law was changed in the 1960s to state that women continue to retain their separate identity after marriage. And in 1987, as a young academic, I wrote an article arguing that the law should be changed to allow the offence of marital rape. You will be pleased to know that in 2002, Hong Kong made it clear in the Crimes Ordinance that rape can take place within marriage. Singapore did so, but only much later, in January 2020. You can see from this example that what shape and form law takes is very much dependent on societal attitudes. And this is because law is a social construct. Think about it. If you are the only person on a desert island, law is completely irrelevant. You can do whatever you like without any consequences except to yourself. The moment there is more than one person other than you, things change. Let us assume a family. Parents and their three children are stranded on the island. Immediately, there will be some rules that apply to all of them. These rules will be set by the parents to regulate things such as consumption of water and other supplies and how to go about doing things to ensure survival for as long as possible. These rules are not laws, but have the same effect because everyone is expected to comply and if the children don't, they might be punished. And if the parents themselves don't follow their own rules, they might find it more challenging to get their children to do so, even with the prospect of punishment. You can well imagine the children saying to their parents, if you are not following the rules, why must I? So there are both positive benefits from following the rules, better prospects of survival, and this benefits from not doing so. Let us take another example. From the late 18th century into the 19th century, 
there were waves of migration from southern China to parts of Southeast Asia because of the instability of the Qing dynasty. And the same would have happened from people coming into Hong Kong as well. Many of the immigrants settled in Singapore and Malaysia, which was under British rule. They spoke no English and could not relate to English law. Being in an unfamiliar land, they did the natural thing by gathering with people they were familiar with. Other Chinese, particularly those from the same village, town, or those that spoke the same dialect. These clan organizations had their own rules, and whenever there were disputes, the organization would resolve these disputes internally. In other words, not through formal law, but informal rules. So you can see from this that the moment human beings have to live together, there is a need for some ground rules to regulate what people can or cannot do for their mutual self-interest. And this is accompanied by a process through which disputes can be resolved. Such informal rules can work in small or cohesive groups that are dependent on long-term relationships. For example, a Cantonese member of the Jihin Kongsi, Yixing Kongsi, in Singapore in the early 19th century would voluntarily comply with the rules because the organization provided him with protection and a safety blanket if he fell on hard times. Such informal rules would be more important to him than the formal rules of the British colonial government. Beyond such close-knit communities, and certainly in large and in personal communities and cities like Hong Kong, New York, Barcelona, London, Singapore, informal rules that rely on personal compliance do not work so well. Many people can live for years in an area and not even know their neighbours. So the scope for community policing of informal rules is weakened. As such, you need more formal rules to regulate society so that everyone clearly knows what their rights and obligations are and what happens when there is non-compliance. Therefore, you have criminal law to deter acts that society considers to be very harmful. You have tort law to provide for compensation to others that you have harmed. And you have contract law to ensure that agreements entered into are treated seriously. If you think about it, all these areas of the law demonstrate how important the law is for society to function in an orderly and fair way. If people can beat up others or rob them without any consequences, I have no doubt that more such acts will take place. And when you find yourself going home at night, you might find that there's more criminal activity around you. If companies can do business without being concerned about safety, and if those who are harmed cannot claim compensation, societies will see more unsafe industrial practices. If you can enter into a contract and later decide not to honour it, how will companies do business and employ workers? So if we don't have law as we understand it, we will have a different type of law, what I refer to as the law of the jungle, where the rich, the powerful, and the strong do what they want, take what they want, and there is little 
that the ordinary person like you or I can do about it. Law is therefore necessary for complex social organisms to function. It is a product, a construct of society that attempts to balance the rights and obligations of members of society to ensure that all people will be treated fairly and equally before the law. This is why the image of Lady Justice is a woman who is blindfolded. It signifies that the law is blind to the identity of everyone and all are equal in the eyes of the law. Because law is a social construct, as societies change, the law must also change. For instance, with the internet, and social media, criminal law has been enlarged to include offences such as doxing and sexual grooming. Laws relating to cyber security are also going to become more important. The continued rise and rise of big business and the market power that they are capable of exercising. Just think of Google, Facebook and Alibaba has made competition law or antitrust law much more important. And therefore, many jurisdictions in Asia, such as Hong Kong, have passed such laws recently. Now, as an ordinary citizen, and someone who will join the workforce in the future, you will encounter law in many different ways. It is useful to know that the content of law is very dependent on what citizens think is right or wrong. In other words, societies ultimately construct the law so that it serves the needs of society effectively while reflecting the social norms of its people. Discussion about the law is not only for lawyers like myself, every citizen should feel able to participate. And if you are interested in being a lawyer, such a deep understanding of law that takes into account the history, the politics, and the economics of a society is extremely important so that you develop a deep understanding it is never enough to understand the rules only. It is more important to understand the underlying reasons behind the rule. In particular, why society has constructed that rule. In conclusion, I would like to say to all of you that being an engaged citizen means being concerned about the nature of the laws that govern us as a society and ensuring that your voice is heard. Thank you. <laughs>